My name is Frances Greenslade, and I'm a writer living in Penticton, BC. My new book, Red Fox Road, is about a 13-year-old girl named Francie who gets stranded on a remote road in the Oregon wilderness after her dad takes a shortcut following the GPS. This is from chapter three. Mom said we should gather all our food so we'd know what we had. I had two pepperoni sticks and three pieces of juicy fruit gum. Mom had half a bag of bar barbecue chips and almost a full bag of scotch mints. Dad had about a quarter bag of sunflower seeds. Then there was a block of cheese, half a loaf of bread, three apples and three granola bars. The apples and granola bars were supposed to be our afternoon snack before we got to the motel. We all had our bottles of water too, but getting more water shouldn't be a problem because there was still snow in places and we had the stove and fuel. It's a shame we don't have coffee, Mom said. I don't know how I'm going to face the morning without coffee. I poked at the fire with a stick. We can make tea from fir needles. Actually, there's lots of things you can make tea from. She smiled. I don't think fir needles are going to quite cut it as a coffee substitute. Dandelion root. I think I've heard of that. I'll pass. I guess I can live without coffee for one morning of my life. Dad came back and squatted by the fire, warming his hands. It gets chilly when that sun's gone, doesn't it? What did you find up there? It's rough, but it's a road. I followed it a ways. Pretty rocky, but the GPS is clearly showing the highway up ahead. I'm guessing it's about 15 miles. I really can't miss it if I just keep walking south. Famous last words, Mom said. I'll get up at first light. We'll be out of here by noon, early afternoon at the latest. Well, that's good because we don't have much to eat. We won't starve, Dad said. People can go without food longer than you think, I said. You can't go very long without water, but as long as you're drinking water, you can last a long time. Gandhi went on a hunger strike for 21 days. I think that's an experiment I'd rather not try, Mom said. You've got no fat on you, Dad said. You'd be lucky to make it a week. He circled my wrist with his fingers. Look at that. Gandhi was pretty skinny, Dad. How do you know all this, Mom said. I read about it. Anyway, we're being kind of ghoulish. No one's going to be starving to death. Speaking of that, Dad said, what should we eat? You're going to need something for your hike tomorrow, Mom said. How about we have some bread and cheese now and split one, of, one or two of the apples? Sounds good to me, Dad said. It was crowded in the tent that night, and I was pushed up against the side, so my sleeping bag was getting wet from condensation. The ground was a bit cold, too, and I thought I should have put the tarp down first. And then there were the noises. There are a lot of noises when you sleep in a tent. The wind was up, and every once in a while it gusted, and a shower of little twigs and debris from the trees landed on the tent. I heard Dad start from his sleep and then listened as his breathing went back to normal. Sometime before dawn, it started to rain. Normally, I love the sound of rain on the tent, but I kept thinking of Dad and how he'd have to be walking in it. The rain woke Mom, too. I could feel her listening as she lay beside me. In fact, I think all three of us were awake, and we stayed like that, listening to the rain, until a pale gray light dawned. I want you to take the tent. Mom whispered to Dad. I don't need the tent. I want to be light on my feet. No, listen, you probably won't need it, but neither will we. We have the truck. I just don't want you out in that rain without shelter, just in case. In case what? In case it's further than you think. It's not. The technology doesn't lie. I've told you before, you have to trust the technology. Just humor me then. No sleeping bag. Just the tent in case you need to stop and you need shelter. All right, I'll take the tent. That means I need my pack. I want to leave right away. Francie, I'm awake. Can you pack up the tent for Dad, please? He had the tent. He had matches, his GPS, one of the pepperoni sticks, an apple, and a granola bar, water. He had good hiking boots, waterproof. He had a hat, his Canada Post toque, then his hoodie, then his yellow rain jacket. You brought your work toque, Mom said. Gotta have the magic toque, Dad said. It makes me walk faster. This wool toque was a joke between Mom and Dad. There was a drawer full of brand new ski hats at home that Mom had bought him for Christmas, 
and Dad had never worn any of them. He liked the old navy blue and red Canada Post toque he wore to work every day. Mom fussed over his pack and tried to keep the tears out of her eyes. Now that he was really going, there were no more jokes. It was only 15 miles and he walked close to that in a regular work day. But he was walking into the dense Oregon forest and in spite of what he had said about the GPS, he didn't know exactly where he was going or what might be in his path to get there. What if there was a mountain? What if there was a river? I wanted to say something, but I didn't want to seem like I doubted him. Okay, squirt, he said, and kissed the top of my head. Catch you later. I'll bring you a hot chocolate. How does that sound? He hefted his pack and pulled the straps tighter. Should we bet on how long it'll take me? Never mind that, said Mom. We don't want you rushing. It'll take how long it takes. Dad grinned. See, that's why I, why I married you. He winked at me and turned to the road. It was now or never. He took a step. Dad, he turned around. I just wonder, you could always go the other way. I know a squirt, but it'd take me two days at least. Don't worry, I'll be back before you know it. So he walked away and disappeared into the curtain of rain. We watched as the trees swallowed him up. I wrote this book because I'd heard a lot of stories about people who followed their GPS, even when it seems obvious that it's bad advice, even when the road that they are on is getting worse and they can see it. And so I wondered how that happens and also what I would do if it happened to me. So I just kind of imagined um, that scenario. And also a lot of books that I read that are set in the wilderness make it seem like nature is our enemy like the biggest threat when you're out there is crazed animals like wolves and bears waiting to attack us. And I know that that's not true. And I really wanted to show a different relationship with nature. So um, my character, Francie, is she's scared in her situation alone in the woods, but, but she's also, she also finds comfort in the wilderness. She's at home there. And I think that's just really important in a time of climate change to realize that we, uh, nature isn't our enemy. We can't just try and make it fit our needs. So that was important to me to just show that kind of different relationship that um, often is not what's portrayed in, in movies that you see um, that, that are set in the wilderness. So besides reading a lot of books, about survival. I went to Oregon to do research for the book. Um, I wanted to find out what kind of trees would be there, um, what kind of plants and animals, and just what it would feel like. Um, the funny thing is that on my way home, I stopped at a gas station, and when I came out, I went the wrong way. And so I drove for over an hour before I discovered that I was going west instead of going north. And I was getting deeper in the forest, which I had started to notice that the, the landscape around me was changing. And so I, I backtracked a few kilometers and I saw a little side road that I thought would probably save me um, a couple, probably save me quite a bit of backtracking. Um, but I realized then that I was doing pretty much what my characters do in the book. So uh, when they get into trouble, so I decided it would be better to drive all the way back to the gas station and uh, um, where I made the wrong turn in the first place. But when I got home, I made that mistake. Uh, I used that mistake in the book to explain why they had taken the shortcut that they that they did because um, I hadn't quite worked that out yet to my satisfaction and. Uh, uh, the father, Len, is quite a cautious man, so I knew he wouldn't just take the, the shortcut for fun. So, so this uh, mistake that I made was, was something I could use in the book to explain why they took that shortcut. Um, I also, uh, one of the things I had to do was I had to check with my mechanic about what would make an engine seize. And uh, 
and what it sounds like. So when I originally wrote it, I, I described the noise when the engine seizes on their truck, I described the noise as a clacking noise. And I told Henry, my mechanic, that, and he said, no, no, it's a clunk, clunk. <laughs> and so he was very insistent. It's clunk, clunk. And so that's what I wrote in the book. So I was very thankful to Henry for that piece of advice. Uh, a few books that I recommend that I've actually read fairly recently. Um, they're, they're classics, but they really stand the test of time. So um, Hatchet is one that probably a lot of people are familiar with. It's by Gary Paulson, and it's about a boy who survi survives a, a plane crash, and then he has to survive in the wild. Another one I really like is called Banner in the Sky. I did read that when I was younger. It's a climbing story. I think it's set in Switzerland. Um, it's by James Ramsey Allman. Um, Island of the Blue Dolphins uh, is by Scott O'Dell, and that's about a girl stranded alone on an island, and I like it because it's a, a girl protagonist. Um, and one that I really love is called Emily of New Moon. It's by Lucy Maud Montgomery, who wrote the Anne of Green Gables books, but I had never read it until about six months ago, and I just love it. It's about a girl who wants to be a writer, but she also really loves nature, and uh, she, it's set in the in PEI. And um, I wish I had read that book when I was younger. I, I just never knew that it existed, so that's a favorite of mine now. Yes, I'd be offering virtual author visits. Um, probably the best way to contact me is through my website, francisgreenslade.com, and there's a uh, contact me page. So that's probably the most, the quickest way to contact me. My name is Francis Greenslade, and my book is called Red Fox Road.